I went and met Richard Curran uh, to tell him I was coming here. He know, he's, of course, a big fan of the SAC, and I, w I told him about the seminar and about the title um, or the topic that I had been assigned that we had sort of talked about that I would be doing. And he said, I've left. <laughs> and, I, and I deliberately, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> and, and I wanted to leave it in there. He was joking, of course, because he is a great advocate of the museum as um, the local museum, as the um, organization, uh, a very uh, organization uh, um, and advocate for intangible cultural heritage. But I left it in there because I think it's, um, we, had, we, up, we went on to have a good conversation, but uh, with his permission, I wanted it in there as a reminder of three things. Um, one, there is, no, there is no unitary heritage policy at the Smithsonian, nor can there be. Um, the Smithsonian is, um, there are 19 museums, uh, and including the National Zoo, um, and each of which has different material culture collections, obligations to its publics and source communities, as they're called, um, different um, goals of collection, interpretation, display, and restitution or giving back. Um, um, and um, the second point I think we were, that we touched on in the conversation is, on the other hand, there are multiple practices, heritage practices um, of, uh, we can argue about whether we like the terminology or not, but conservation protection, uh, documentation, archiving, um, and giving back and restitution that are ongoing at the Smithsonian and at all, and many museums that we all know about that, ha that predate the 2003 Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. Um, and that's, I think, an important point to keep in mind because while it brought a lot of attention to certain things that uh, we all need to pay attention to, these, these practices have been ongoing and need consolidation in a different form. So that's what I'm, the other thing I'm going to try and do here. And, um, and this is both in terms of the relationship between tangible and intangible heritage and the relationship with communities themselves as these large universal survey museums begin to engage with their communities more and more. And this is, I, I, I realize it's sort of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little different from the eco-museum and local museum idea, but I think it's an important one to keep in mind. And the third one really is to remind us that um, heritage policy, policies, um, because we must not talk about it in the singular, uh, and practices are different. They're conflated in the policy world, but they're not the same. Um, in the case of museums, good practices need to kind of often decide it on a case-by-case -case basis. It's very ad hoc. Um, sh can, should, should inform better policy. And in turn, progressive policy um, in an ideal world should be able to map new ways in which to embrace core values, core mission values of inclusion, uh, justice, access, collaboration, and again, what's known in the, in, in, in the American museum world as giving back. So what, what do you give back? What do universal museums give back to the, way, to the rest um, is, uh, is, is a theme I'll keep coming back to here. Um, what, in, the, in the conversation with Curran, what also emerged is when, as we began to talk, we said what's really needed in, for heritage policy in 21st century museums is a critical reflective museology that, ke that has kept pace with these cultural changes. Um, we are, I, I think you've all read about the, the no changing notions or at least ideas of museums from temples to forums and uh, things like that. So, that's, so institutionally, there's a way in which that needs to be um, kept in mind. But it also needs to be grounded by museum collections. Um, the cultural policy think tanks in the U.S. are usually based in academic centers uh, in, uh, in, in universities. And while that, um, uh, they, they, they've, they've made important strides in some fields, it's also important to be aware of what exactly, what the tangible coll collections are in some of these museums. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> um, that uh, we are engaging with. They have to collaborate with grassroots communities, with communities of all sorts, and they have to speak to global cultural imperatives of uh, democracy, justice, equity, and voice. So what would 
what would such a grounded participatory museology look like at the SI? Turns out that it's already there. Some of it is already there. Collaborative curation that has been occurring uh, in the American Indian Museum, civic and local community engagement. Not never perfect, but it, it is happening in pockets. Um, no folklore without the folk is um, is actually a mantra. Is a working. Um, ideology of the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Uh, Ralph Linz Rinsler famously said it, and so it's, it's invoked every year during, in, you know, during the festival. Um, broad public access and a safe space for democratic discourse and difficult subjects um, that are not often easy to talk about. And um, uh, in museology, there's another trend toward looking at fault lines and contests and museum frictions in the literature, so that's another um, large area that the Smithsonian has been trying to look at, just in terms of um, goals. And the last, responsible restitution, which is really what I'm going to be looking at for the rest of it, for the rest of the talk. Um, this goes, if you, if you look at the ICOM definition of a museum, the 2007 definition, which I think you're aware of, um, some of these some of these factors don't, they keep changing this and updating these every few years, but some of them do, don't actually make it into this definition. Too close. I just put together a very short list to give you a range of, uh, to give you a sense of the plurality, uh, just in terms of returns and restitution at the, at the Smithsonian, a very, very short list of the kind of things, of the kind of genres and the, kind of, and the museums that have been dealing with them uh, in some form across the museums. So you have sacred objects from the American Indian Museum, human remains, uh, a long-standing repatriation office in the Natural History Museum, oral histories in the new and virtual collections in the, in, in the National Amer African American History and Culture Museum, antiquities that has been going on in terms of um, uh, claims from nations on what they own. So this is all tangible, but I think they have intangible components. Art provenance is a huge program in the World War II era of Nazi-owned art, um, which uh, has success, some of which has been successfully returned. Underwater archaeology, which is contested. Um, digital returns has taken a new, this is something Kate has been working on um, with the Arctic Study Circle, where they have been trying to actually, there's, there's, a, there's a way in which they, they're giving back the photographs uh, and helping the communities work on exhibitions around the objects, although the objects remain with the, uni with, with the museum. It's, not, it's an imperfect solution, but that's sort of one way they're actually working with the photo initiative of the Smithsonian. Living traditions, of course, and sound and music, which is folk life and folk ways, uh, which I'll get to soon. And uh, I just put in at the end um, a seminar that Kate was part of, and that's where we met, called After the Return, um, which was talking about what digital repatriation really means. Uh, and uh, does it mean anything at all? Is this something real or is it a cop-out? And can it mean a circulation of knowledge back to the communities? Please stop, I mean, if I, I'm, I'm known as a fast talker as well, so if, please stop me if I'm going too fast and we can make this interactive. So it's the last that I'm going to be, it's really, I will be focusing on restitution. The real talk, uh, the real topic uh, that I will be dealing with right now, as Alex and I talked about this a little bit, is music returns, music repatriation at Smithsonian folkways. So one genre, one heritage genre, uh, music, which is understudied. Uh, usually you have visual images that are talked about a lot with digital returns in the Smithsonian folkways. And I'll get to describing the uniqueness of that particular museum uh, in a bit. What, uh, I mean, w I want to focus on returns as at the Smithsonian in two specific ways um, that I think help broaden the discussion. Um, and this is a joint effort that some of us at the Folkways have been working closely with Kate's group, uh, the after, the after the return group. Um, one is, if one looks at it as a form of cultural rights, and I have the, um, uh, which, which, which is a category, uh, as a category of human rights. Um, 
that, that's one, that's sort of one perspective I'll be using. The second is by focusing on music returns, which is understudied, uh, it offers a way to think about intangible returns that, that in ways that go beyond ownership and individual artistic expression. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Typically, international repatriation and both advocates and critics of international repatriation have tended to, um, to, look, to look at the process either through the property lens, that is as cultural objects or knowledge to be owned and reclaimed by nations or tribes on the grounds of patrimony or sacred and ceremonial content. So if, you know, if the objects are, have some ceremonial use, they can be reclaimed and by law they have to be returned. Or with, dig with digital returns, the other lens that people use uh, that writers and scholars have been using uh, and advocates is through the lens of artistic expression, which, is, which assumes individual authorship, that is artist rights, through the, through the frame of moral rights. Um, the second thing that music or digital music returns allows us to think about is a new way of thinking about museum obligations um, with, with intangible heritage returns that are only going to be getting more and more common as museum collections increasingly engage with communities but cannot, cannot actually give up on the ownership. They have to read, the Smithsonian Folkways, for instance, owns many of the recordings by contract. Uh, and what, while they cannot, while they've talked about giving, giving back the ownership to various communities, they can't for various reasons, for legal reasons. So the other way to do it is to, by thinking of creative ways in which to extend licenses uh, or royalties uh, and have the material benefits kind of transfer back to the communities. So, so it's, a, it's a way to think about museums as stewards, as, as stewards of, of this knowledge, of this, if this culture, of, of, of cultural brokers, but more importantly, stewards uh, who are holding it for the communities in question. And the other thing, finally, it suggests that digital returns can be transformative for communities sometimes, um, both materially through the trans, you know, if they, if they earn through royalties and through licenses, but also what is known as circulation of indigenous knowledge. Uh, that is, if they contribute to the reuse and revitalization of music and the redistribution of the contextualization of that knowledge. And while these are all just big words, I'll get to the case studies and I think you, I think you might see what I'm trying to, to say because the royalties and the financial rewards that may accrue from the ownership might help in certain ways, but what really gives them control, it's called the terms of use. It's called control over the use of knowledge rather than the ownership itself. I've included um, uh, Rosemary Coombe and El Elizabeth Coleman's um, a quote from their article, which is very important in the music repatriation literature because it's about restitution for historical injuries uh, that because of the, the, the recordings that are owned by the Smithsonian, but they're also a way in which to, to look at the past, but also allow the way for the communities to reimagine not only their past, but articulate their futures. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a creative way of actually getting at this. Why music? Music becomes an ideal kind of heritage genre to think with for some scholars because recorded music lies at the heart of worldwide cultural wars, um, both in terms of the recording industry and their monopoly on, on rights, but also because it allows you to work against business interests uh, and other ways in which to think about ownership here. But the second thing, the second really important reason is that music as a category in Western law um, scholars say, has the capacity, especially through digital technology, to divorce the ethnological content of the song um, from the, the whole, the cultural work that the song uh, was recorded in, or the capacity, the social capacity of the song itself. Um, and therefore, when you're thinking of digital returns, of actually returning the song to the community, um, from universal uh, museums. It can have uh, effects like cultural renewal. It can have, it can 
think about social justice, it can talk about indigenous self-determination, not just moving the song back at, in terms of ownership or property. I see, uh, I mean, I, I think this is, I assumed you might know a little bit about the ownership literature, but I'm, let, I'd be happy to actually talk it through when we come to the case studies in case it's a little dense. It's, it's a legal issue that, that is being navigated. And why folkways? And actually this is, this is I think the reason that um, the folkways collection, the Smithsonian folkways collection becomes an interesting uh, body through which to think this through. Folkways, for those of you who know, who don't know, is actually, it's, it's uh, in the heritage repositories of uh, worldwide of music and in indigenous knowledge. It's somewhat unique because it's both an archival collection of traditional music from around the world and a non-profit recording label. So it's actually a recording label which actually publishes music and sells it. Um, and so it has a duty by virtue of its founder through his will uh, and through the way it was absorbed into the Smithsonian to keep the catalog available in perpetuity. What that means is against the vagaries of the marketplace, against what is needed uh, in terms of a particular place, uh, in terms of popularity, they are enjoined, the, they have a duty to keep any, all, of the, all of the recordings available in perpetuity. While they may not be there physically, they can be ordered and, uh, by anyone. So it's a, it's an, it's an act, it's a recording label. Um, so with the mission that balances, it also in, it, it has revenue, it has revenue needs. So it, 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 um, there's money uh, that they do make from selling these CDs. And I was actually gonna bring them up here to show you, but I will tomorrow. Uh, they balance the revenue needs with cultural documentation and a broad appeal to global audiences uh, through several series of classic jazz, classic bluegrass, uh, but also contemporary uh, um, uh, things from around the world. Because of this duty and this mission, it embodies two innovative ideas for 20th century museums. One is that it digitally returns recording rights to countries of origin through licenses. I'll explain how. Two is that it circulates this knowledge through publication, publication of the, of the CDs. So there's music that is actually published. But when I say published, I mean you know, the, the CD is issued. Um, payment of the royalties to those who created it, to the makers, and license fees every time the music is heard uh, or every time it's actually her, listened to or heard. The brief, I, I think I was not going to, I was going to skip over this, but I think this is important. The brief history of folkways is important here. From 1948 to 86, it was the founder, Moses Ash, this was what they call the private sector history of folkways. Uh, it was called the Folkways Recording Services and, Services and Corporation. Um, it was a very comprehensive archive of not only music, but sound an oral history of everything. You have recordings of frogs in Madagascar to um, early bluegrass and um, early, ba early Bob Dylan, all, uh, mm -hmm. those of you who know folk, folk music, uh, classic recordings of the Seegers, uh, all of that. Um, so he, his idea was that every, there had to be a comprehensive archive of oral history of things that, uh, of, of the world, of the universe. And in his case, of course, he was, this was New York, and it began with the North American continent and then moved worldwide. But that was to 86. In 87, then you had Ralph Rinsler who came and um, changed the way the Folk Life Center was actually run. But the important person for us in this um, situation is Anthony Seeger was the founding director of Smithsonian Folkways. Uh, and in, that was in 1987 when the Smithsonian, which is the national museum of, in the US, uh, absorbed this recording label. So it's, it's one of the, it's, it's unique, it's, called, it's been called the museum, a museum of sound. Um, a New York Times reporter called it the, the answer to, I think he, call, he termed it the ethnographic iTunes. Uh, so it's actually, it's, it's, it, 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 it's a very, it sits, it sits on this fault line of being an archive but it's also a recording label. It actually produces the music that uh, is set around the world. And um, in 2000, around 2000, they met with the cultural, um, the Fokwe's uh, representatives and the director and uh, the associate director 
and um, many representatives met with the cultural attaches of the northern African countries and, uh, to and decided through the State Department that they would evolve a way in which they could actually repatriate, try and repatriate music to their countries of origin. And the concept was very simple. Um, it was simply to license back rights gratis, free, or for a dollar uh, in exchange for royalty with the Smithsonian and rights every time a copy was made. But for everything else, it was actually just given back free to the country involved. It began with North Africa, and um, uh, and and so far. So it's been 2000. I can't. Be, I was trying to put a number on this. And try, what you have to understand is this is not a history that's actually been written or even recorded anywhere. It was just being. This was the first time someone was actually. We were trying to actually compile some idea of what was happening. Again, an example of an ongoing restitution heritage, intangible heritage practice uh, that wasn't really formalized in any way. And I think these are, and they, it was decided case by case. So I'm, I'm sorry it's flattened a bit, but this is a PDF file, I've been told, but uh, because the, my Mac filed in transfer. But I thought I would, um, hmm, I thought I would talk about four cases um, that deal, that show you the diversity of um, not only the music involved and the communities involved, and, but the issues involved and how they were recorded, uh, what happened when each of these were actually restituted or returned to the communities involved. Um, and rather than go through them here, let me just... <clears throat> 